Canada's response has been debated in Parliament, and Conservative leadership candidates are weighing in as well. Jean Charest is one of those candidates. He's in Montreal. Hi, Mr. Charest. Pleasure to have you back on the program. Thank you, Vashi. I wanted to start off with probably the most pressing, and that is, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The interim leader of the Conservative Party, in response to President Zelensky's address the other day, uh, uh, proposed the idea that there be a no-fly zone designated over humanitarian corridors in Ukraine. Uh, do you agree with that position? We have to uh, work very closely with our NATO allies, and we can't move alone on that, uh, Bashi. So uh, I, I, I certainly think that Canada, among other nations, needs to apply pressure on, on Russia in as much as possible, and, and that the Russians know that this is something that is out there. But whatever we do in the end, we have to do it with our NATO allies. But do you specifically think a no-fly zone is, and, and the reason I'm asking is because you know, for, for example, so far, yeah. the president, the head of NATO, they've all said, look, it's too escalatory. Whatever form you want to take it in, it's too escalatory. Uh, your party has proposed somewhat of a, a, a different solution. Okay, do it, but only over certain areas. The response has still been that's too escalatory. Do you think it's too escalatory or do you think it's a smart proposal by your party? I, I think our party is right to apply pressure and to keep this issue and this question on the table. At the end of the day, though, Vashi, we have to move. We can only move with our NATO partners. And, uh, and if that's the position and if the conclusion is that the risk is too high so that we escalate the, uh, the conflict, well, then we have to, I think, uh, respect the, uh, the consensus of our partners on that and continue to work with them and continue to apply sanctions. Upping sanctions uh, is probably... Uh, it makes a lot of sense for us as a country uh, continuing to supply Ukraine with uh, lethal arms because this is uh, something that they need and aid in uh, other ways and plus uh, preparing for what may be a, an influx of Ukrainian refugees to Canada though being careful that we're, we're still early on in the sense that they are out of the country. We don't, uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but we're all of us in Canada, all parties, every province, every, everyone concerned, I think, uh, know that uh, if there are Ukrainian refugees that are coming to Canada, that they will be welcomed here with open arms. In light of uh, what's happening in Ukraine, you wrote an op-ed pledging to, quote, move quickly to ramp up Canadian defense spending yep. to 2 percent of GDP. How quickly would you ramp up that spending? Well, we look at the budget cycle. We have to respect the ability and the capacity of the armed forces to be able to do that. For example, we need to move from 60,000 to 100,000 troops uh, to have uh, all the resources we need. And one of the big issues, Vashi, for Canada, and it's a wake-up call, is our northern sovereignty, the sovereignty of the Arctic. You know, Mr. Harper used to do an annual trip there, and some saw it as symbolic. Well, now I think they understand that there was more to it than that, because Russia is our physically our neighbor in the north. And we have a lot of resources there. There's issues of sovereignty. And that's going to be one of the biggest issues that the next uh, that this generation of Canadians will now be facing the ability for us to occupy the north and to affirm uh, our sovereignty and our armed forces play a key role in that uh, in that respect. The two percent is about the NATO commitment uh, that we've made. We have made this commitment to our NATO allies that we would uh, invest at the uh, at two percent of GDP. So let's get there as rapidly as possible. Uh, and, and certainly, I understand all the points you're making about threats to sovereignty and the the, the need to invest. But when you say as quickly as possible, uh, you know, as someone who's positioned himself as a fiscal conservative, we're talking about an extra fifteen billion dollars when there's a deficit of one hundred and forty four yeah. billion dollars. Are you talking about the next five years ramping up that spending? Or are you talking about the next twenty? It'll be phased in, uh, Vashi, as rapidly as possible as we can do it, you know, based on the choices. And you're right, the budgetary choices that we have to make. But that's what governing is about. You have to make those choices. And I am, yes, very much a fiscal conservative. I have been all my life. I, you know, my government left a $8 billion surplus to Mr. Legault and a higher credit rating in Quebec than uh, Ontario because I, I believe in that. But I also learned from that experience that you can do it in an orderly fashion. You don't have to break everything by reaching that objective of balancing your books. Do it in an orderly fashion. But certainly in this context of the crisis that we're seeing in, in, with Russia attacking Ukraine, every Canadian, I think, understands that this is going to be a high priority for our government and needs to be to be able to protect ourselves. 
Respectfully, how does that differ, though, this idea that you're going to phase in an increase in spending? How does that differ from what the Liberals are already doing? Well, the Liberals did not move on this, uh, you know, in 2015. They've been in government since 2015. They know that this has been in front of them. The uh, procurement process of the armed forces in Canada is a mess. Uh, as we know, just, uh, you know, the whole process to buy new fighter planes has been in, in disarray. We have to bring some order to that so that we can, uh, we can buy the equipment that we need. And, uh, and that's a good example of how the, the Liberal government in the last uh, seven, eight years have been sitting on their hands. They haven't been doing their job on this issue. Re and respectfully, so now, though, the previous, yeah. sorry to interrupt, Mr. Shree, but the previous Conservative government also dragged their foot on spending on defense. There were also well, issues with procurement there, too. And all I'm asking is whether or not your promised increase in spending will happen at a, a different rate than what the Liberals have promised and actually say that they're on track to meeting. What I'm saying today is that this is now moved up as a priority for the government of Canada for reasons that are obvious to anyone who's listening to us today, and especially in regards to the Arctic, and uh, where it is urgent now that we as a country do what we need to do to affirm our sovereignty. And remember one thing about the Arctic, even the United States, even the United States went out of their way in 2019 to say that the Northwest Passage was not Canadian territory. So this isn't uh, an easy issue for us and one with which we have to move with a great deal of, uh, of determination. When you are thinking about uh, future spending and, and things that as uh, you know, leader of the Conservative yeah. Party you would advocate for or as Prime Minister you would enact, uh, do you envision balancing the budget and, and over which period of time? Well, we want to return to a balanced budget, but again, uh, do it in a way that allows us to maintain uh, program spending and not, for example, do as the Liberals did in the 90s. I was there when they cut cash transfers to the provinces 40% in one single swoop and, and, and caused a lot of damage to the healthcare systems across the country by doing it. And what I've learned is that the, the basic discipline that we need to bring to government spending starts by making sure that program spending is well under control. What I did in Quebec was program spending that was below what we call nominal growth in the economy, which means that it becomes virtuous and that you, you're able to rebalance without uh, actually uh, breaking uh, social programs or affecting the healthcare system. So that's part of the choices you have to do. And it's done over a period of time and we'll see what the numbers are when I'm in government and what they look like, but it'll be done in a very disciplined manner, which is not the case now, certainly not now. Am I to interpret that as, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be saying, I can balance the books. I mean, we know what the deficit is right, right now, $144 billion. You're not going to be coming out and saying, I will balance the books in, in 10 years, which is what Aaron O'Toole promised in the last election. Do you envision putting a number on it like that, or, or are you just going to uh, sort of say what we you will. Just well, we'll speak to that in due course, Bashi. This is the beginning of the leadership race. We will speak to that issue in due course, and we'll do it in, a, in an orderly fashion. And, uh, and we'll do it in a way that allows us to pr protect uh, program spending and not, uh, again, disrupt basic services like health care that uh, are going to be so critically important, especially when we draw the lessons from the COVID episode. So there's a lot to balance there. And, uh, and, uh, and, and my record has been one of doing that job while also maintaining the basic services to which people have a right. And again, I mean, the record speaks for itself. After 15 years of government in Quebec, Mr. Legault was left an $8 billion surplus. You're not gonna see that in your lifetime again, by the way. But that was the discipline that I brought to government spending. When you say you'd maintain program spending or you'd, you'd try to protect program spending. Would you keep the liberal child care deals with provinces? Yes, uh, the child care initiative is important. It has to be tailored to the needs of every province in the way that they want to deliver those services. And uh, in Quebec, for example, uh, the effect of the daycare initiative has been pretty important. It allowed us to uh, increase substantially the participation rate of women in the labor market, which is very much a need with an aging population and less workers. And, and I ask because, I, and I'm sure you'll understand, your, your opponents will attack you for 
uh, for saying that you'll support a program that costs eight, even though I take your point on it, the productivity part of it, but that costs eight billion dollars uh, a year. That you, uh, you know, are are saying you'll balance the budget or you'll think about it, but you don't have a specific timeline. Like this is what. Uh, for example, Pierre Polyev uh, will say is lacking in your campaign that you call yourself a fiscal conservative, but you don't have meat on the bone. What's your response to that? I have a record. And I don't think any of my adversaries have a record. I have a record, Vashi, and my record speaks for itself with real results, tangible, real, real results. That's that's what I have. And, and in regards to families and reduction of poverty, when I, I left office, we had reduced poverty, poverty substantially in Quebec. And, uh, and the daycare program, which was started by the PQ government, by the way. And when I arrived in Quebec politics in 98, I was reticent about it. I thought it cost a lot of money. But uh, what we learned from it, and, and we have to have the ability in politics to learn these things, don't we? I mean, just as opposed to just sloganeering and giving lines and reading uh, speaking points. The net result was an increase in productivity, increase in family incomes, reduction in poverty, even an, uh, an increase in the birth rate. I mean, all these things come together. And, and you have to be able to look at the larger picture as opposed to just, you know, going out there and sloganeering and, uh, and uh, practicing American style politics. That's not what this, this country needs. You've talked about your record. And uh, in fact, again, your opponents have, have used your record uh, to criticize you. And I, and I want to uh, offer you the chance to explain uh, some of that to Canadians yeah. who are listening tonight. And, and particularly, you know about Huawei, right? Uh, your spokesperson yeah. has said, uh, I think in a, I read in an article to Global Mail, uh, Global, Global News, pardon me, you'll uphold the position of the CPC that would ban Huawei from yeah. 5G. Did you view Huawei as a threat to security, to national security, while you were working for them? When I did work, I worked also, to be very clear, on helping free the two Michaels. I worked very directly with Vina Najibula, who I think you know and others know, who was the main spokesperson for the two Michaels and the families. And she uh, was married to Michael Kovrig at the time. And I'm very proud of that, uh, Vashi. I mean, I worked so that we could find a solution and bring the two Michaels home. Now, any of the work I did was never in contradiction with the national interest of Canada. I would not have accepted to, uh, to do that. And, uh, and that's, that's the way that I've conducted myself ever since I've left office. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very much at ease with that. And I'm proud to have made a contribution and worked with uh, Vina Najibula, who's made a statement about that, by the way, of helping her and helping uh, the families bring the two Michaels home. Yeah, I actually spoke to Vina to ask her that question, and, and she did. She said that you were supportive. And, and so my, my question is yeah. not to cast doubt on that. My question is simply that uh, your spokesperson and, and you have, have not disagreed, but you say that you would support the Conservatives' position that Huawei yes. should not be entered into, vi uh, into 5G because it is a threat to That's national true. security. So how yeah, can you reconcile that for Canadians? When you, you know, uh, your law firm and you did work for them, I understand the Michaels are one thing, but, you know, if, if, did you did you think they were a, na a threat to national security at any point during your work with them? The position that you have just reported is my position as a leader of the Conservative Party and a Prime Minister of Canada. And when I'm in that job, I'm I'm representing the interest of Canada, period, period, full stop period. The rest, I, I'm not going, there's no lawyer who comments on the work they did for one or another client. Frankly, Vashi, you know that, and everyone who knows anything about the, the business of law knows that. Uh, so more of a reason to speak to me very directly as you're doing on what is the position I'm going to defend. And it's very clear, we're going to ban Huawei. That's the position of the party. That's the position that I'm going to defend, and I'm going to represent the interest of Canada. And by the way, I never shied away from criticizing the government of uh, China in the last few years, no matter what I was doing. And, uh, and I've done it publicly. And, uh, and, and that's the way I've always conducted myself. So I think Canadians can be reassured that uh, in the end, whatever it is, I'm going to stand up for Canada and the basic core interest of our country. Do you regret at all the work for Huawei? Just given the perception, I take the points you're making, but given the perception that Canadians had, this is a state, 
you know, a, a, very, a, a company with extremely close ties to the state. You know what ended yeah. up happening with the two Michaels. When you look back on it, do you think, hey, maybe that wasn't uh, the right thing to do? Vashi, and you, you've just told me that Vina Najibullah confirmed to you what I'm saying to you today. I actually had an opportunity to work to help free the two Michaels and bring them home. And I'm proud of having done that work. And that was in the interest of, of course, two individuals who uh, were, you know, were the victims of a government sanctioned kidnapping. There's no other way of saying it. And, uh, and I'm proud of having done that work and, and bringing them back home. Do you have a pact with Patrick Brown as the Toronto Star is reporting? No, I don't. And I've known Patrick Brown a long time and uh, he came into politics with me and I'm going to establish a relationship with all the candidates if, if possible during the campaign uh, because we're all of the same party. And when I become leader, I want the other candidates to be part of our team and unite the party. And I'm going to, by the way, I mean, you, you talked about the other candidates who keep attacking me. I mean, there's some candidates spend more time attacking me than actually running their own campaign. And that says something. I take it as a compliment. And in the case of Patrick Brown, uh, I, I'm going to establish, a, I, we have a good relationship, but in the end, the members vote. There is no deal anywhere. There's no, no deal that the members are are going to have to abide by because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will be choosing the next leader of our party. Are you committed to running as a conservative candidate, even if you do lose the leadership? I will win the leadership. I will be the leader of the party. I'll unite the party. And I'll tell you what, Vash, it's going to be very exciting because then we'll have a, about two years, not a lot of time, but enough time to prepare for an election campaign and to elect a national government, which will include, by the way, Alberta and Quebec and all of the Atlantic and the Maritimes, the West and British Columbia and the territories. I mean, I'm, that's why I'm running for my very deep belief in Canada. And this country can only work if we, are, if we have that vision and leaders committed to it as opposed to wedge politics so that the, we, can, we can meet our potential, our full potential as a country. Being born Vashi in Canada is like winning the lottery or having citizenship is like winning the lottery. I mean, it literally, out of no merit of our own, if you've been born here, and yet we're way under our potential. So this Conservative Party has to get its act together. Canadians expect the party to be united and to present a national vision. It is our responsibility to do so, and I will make that happen. With great respect, that's a, 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 a campaign pitch to our viewers, but it didn't answer my question. Will, will you run uh, if you well, lose? I'm going to win. I'm going to win the campaign and I will run. Of course I will run. But I interpret I that as you won't run otherwise. Party. No, don't interpret it any other way, Vashi. What I'm telling you is, is factual. I will win this election as leader of the party and I will be the next uh, Prime Minister of Canada. That's the only way to interpret it. Okay, I'll leave it there. That's not really an answer to my question, but I'll have, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to is. ask again. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Charest. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you, Vashi. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.